Whosoever will be saved before all things, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic, that is, universal faith. Which faith, except everyone do keep whole and undefiled, without doubt he shall perish everlastingly. And the universal faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Spirit. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, and the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father incomprehensible, the Son incomprehensible, the Holy Spirit incomprehensible. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, and the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet they are not three eternals, but one eternal. And also there are not three incomprehensibles, nor three uncreated, but one uncreated and one incomprehensible. So likewise, the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, and the Holy Spirit almighty. And yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God. And the Holy Spirit is God, and yet they are not three gods, but one God. So likewise, the Father is Lord, the Son Lord, and the Holy Spirit Lord, and yet not three lords, but one Lord. For as we are compelled by the Christian verity to acknowledge each person by himself to be both God and Lord, so we are also forbidden by the Christian religion to say that there are three gods or three lords. The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The Son is of the Father alone, not made nor created, but begotten. The Holy Spirit is of the Father, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. So there's one Father, not three fathers. One Son, not three sons. One Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And in the Trinity, none is before or after another. None is greater or less than another. But all three persons are co-eternal together and co-equal, so that in all things, as is aforesaid, the unity in Trinity and the Trinity in unity is to be worshipped. He, therefore, that will be saved must think thus of the Trinity. So reads the first part of the Athanasian Creed, a creed that has come down to us from the Middle Ages of the Christian church. A creed not written by Athanasius, but named after him, that wonderful 4th century saint and leader of the church who stood against the errors of a man who was determined to teach the church that Jesus Christ is a creature. All true Christians believe what Athanasius defended and what his creed that is named after him asserts, that the true and living God is one God in three persons, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, three in one. We have confessed that this morning in the Apostles' Creed, as we have said that we believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ, His Son, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. To be a Christian is to know and to be reconciled to this God. It is to trust the Son of God, Jesus Christ, as Lord. It is to be adopted into the family of God and to know the paternal love and the care that comes from God the Father. It is to be guided and comforted and empowered by the one whom the Father and the Son sent into the world to indwell God's people, God the Holy Spirit. It is God the Spirit that the Apostle Paul is primarily concerned with in Romans chapter 8. And we return to that chapter of that book today in our ongoing study through this letter from the Apostle Paul to the church at Rome. Our text is Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11. Romans 8, 9 through 11. I encourage you to get a copy of God's Word and open there because we're just simply going to look at the words that the Spirit of God inspired the Apostle Paul to write and see the message that God has for us from this text. If you're using one of the Bibles that's provided for you in the chair in front of you, you'll find this passage on page 944. Romans chapter 8, 
verses 9, 10, and 11. So you follow along in your copy of God's word as I read this portion of scripture aloud. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. To be in the spirit means that you are indwelt by God and that you have supernatural, eternal life. That's what Paul is teaching us in our passage today. Earlier in this chapter, in Romans 8, we see Paul has begun to contrast life in the spirit with life in the flesh. Life in the flesh, referring to those who are living as unbelievers, those who are unconverted, It is a person who is still enslaved to sin. The sin nature dominates his life. It's not simply a reference to physical bodies, but to human nature as corrupted and directed and controlled by sin, as the theologian John Murray puts it. In contrast to that life is life in the spirit, which means to live as a Christian, as someone in whom the Holy Spirit of God has worked in order to reveal Christ, to grant faith and repentance. Now, Paul has just described in verses 7 and 8 the seriousness of the condition of those people who are in the flesh. He says they do not please God. Indeed, they cannot please God. They do not keep the commandments of God because they cannot keep the commandments of God. What he is saying is that to be in the flesh is to be enslaved to sin. There well may be some of you here this morning of whom that is true. And you may have religious thoughts and you may have certain inclinations toward God and spirituality. But if you are not in the spirit, you're in the flesh and you are a slave to sin. And though you walked into the room this morning as a slave to sin, you do not have to walk out of the room this morning as a slave to sin by God's kindness and grace and bringing you here today as he sets his word before you. And as His spirit does his work, you can be set free from sin and you can be reconciled to your creator to be in the spirit means that you're no longer in the flesh. It means to be indwelt by God, to have supernatural eternal life. Let's look at these three verses together this morning to see what it is that the Spirit of God would say to this church on this occasion through His Word. In verse 9, we see that to be in the Spirit is to have God Himself dwelling in you. Paul says, You, however, in contrast to what he's just read, or written about those who are in the flesh, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. To be in the Spirit is to have the Spirit of God in you. This is exactly what Jesus said the Holy Spirit would do when He, together with the Father, would send Him into the world. Don read this chapter earlier in John 14, and in that chapter we see in verses 16 and 17, Jesus making this very promise. Hear it again. He says, I will ask the Father, and He will give you another Helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you by which he meant in his own person, in the person of the son of God. The spirit of God was with the disciples, but he says when the, but he will also will be in you, in you. When Jesus sends the spirit, the spirit will come not simply to be with us. He will come to be in us. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, before he's ascended into heaven, in the presence of his disciples, he tells them, you will be my witnesses, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, upon you. 
upon you in the sense of into you. This little word that is translated upon in that passage is translated in in other places like John 3.16, that whoever believes in Jesus, the Son of God, in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's the same word. Or Acts 16.31, when the jailer asks Paul and Silas, what he must do to be saved. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe in, believe upon. It, it's this intimate involvement with. If the Spirit of God dwells in you, God dwells in you. When Paul says it like this, if the Spirit of God, he's not being doubtful. He's not suggesting, well, you know, we don't really know if the Spirit does or not. It could be translated sense or seeing that the Spirit of God dwells in you. The point he's making is this, that the ground on which the assertion of the first part of the verse is made is the second part of the verse, the fact that the Spirit is in you. In other words, he's saying you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God is in you. And that fact, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, is what makes it possible or impossible for you to be in the flesh. So to be a Christian is to have God's Spirit residing within you because it's the work of the Spirit in a person that makes him or her a Christian. The Spirit is the only one who can open up spiritually blinded eyes so you can see Jesus. The Spirit's the only one that unstops deaf ears so that you can hear the gospel call coming to you saying, turn from your sin and entrust yourself to the Lord Jesus. The Spirit's the only one who can change you inwardly, who can take what the Scripture describes as a heart of stone because of our sin and exchange it for a heart of flesh, a living heart that can trust and love the Lord Jesus. It is the Spirit who, when He does this work, takes up residence in the new believer. This is what Paul means in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, when he writes, When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Christ, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. He sealed you not by simply something that he did. He sealed you by himself being the seal and coming into your life. Now, there's a lot of confusion in our day about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of Christians. Some groups teach that you can actually be a Christian without possessing the Spirit. And that if you really want to be indwelt by the Spirit, then you need some kind of spiritual experience beyond conversion. And often employing biblical words, they will call this being baptized in or with the Holy Spirit. Some Pentecostal and charismatic Christians teach that this experience with the Holy Spirit is that which only happens after conversion, and not every Christian will experience it. In other words, they say you can be a born-again Christian, you can have the Spirit of God give you new life, but if you're going to be baptized in the Spirit, then you need a second work of the Spirit, what is typically called a second blessing from the Spirit. And when this second blessing comes, Pentecostal theology says, it is always accompanied by speaking in unknown tongues. Very often, what sounds like gibberish to the ears of those who have not experienced it. It's an outburst of unknown utterances. When that happens, this theological perspective says, then a person, you can be sure, has been baptized in the Spirit. Well, we are convinced that such teaching from our Pentecostal and charismatic friends is erroneous. And we're convinced it's erroneous because we believe that they are misreading, misunderstanding the Bible at some key points, especially in some of the passages in Acts that they go to to try to undergird this understanding of this second blessing of the Spirit that you must have for Him to indwell you. They go to Acts chapter 2, the Pentecost, when the Spirit was poured out first on believing Jews, and they see what happened there. And then they go to Acts chapter 8 and see what happened when Philip preached in Samaria and believing Samaritans also had signs, visible signs of the Spirit coming upon them in ecstatic ways. 
And then they go to Acts chapter 10 and they see what happened to believing Gentiles when Peter went and preached the gospel to them. And then in Acts 11, when Peter said, see, the spirit has been given even to the Gentiles. So they are brothers with us. We cannot withhold the gospel from them. But rather than reading these passages as a normal pattern of post-conversion baptism in the spirit, in the spirit, it is far better to recognize what Luke is doing by recording these passages for us in the way that he does. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we get something of the thesis of the whole book of Acts. We get the agenda laid out, the outline given to us when Jesus said that the Spirit will come upon you in power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And what he does then afterwards is show how that prophecy of Jesus, that statement of this is what is going to happen, actually happened and the book of Acts records it. So you see in Acts chapter 2, in Jerusalem, Judea, the Spirit of God is given in power. He comes upon the believers there. It is what we could call, and some have called, the Jewish Pentecost. And then you go to Acts chapter 8, and you see where Philip has gone into Samaria, and the gospel's preached, and they believe, and then the Spirit of God comes in power upon them, manifesting that indeed they too are Christians, and you have the Samaritan Pentecost. And you go to Acts chapter 10 and Peter's explanation in chapter 11 where he is speaking now to Gentiles, Cornelius. And when the gospel comes to Cornelius in power, he believes. And then the Spirit of God comes in power to validate the reality that Gentiles are included in this new covenant saving work of God. So we see, as Luke shows us, the Jewish Pentecost in Acts 2, the Samaritan Pentecost in Acts 8, the Gentile Pentecost in Acts 10, that what Jesus said in Acts 1.8 is actually happening. And here we are today, part of the ends of the earth. And the gospel is still moving. The gospel is still working. The Spirit of God is still coming to convict people of sin and righteousness and judgment and revealing Christ in people. So these experiences that are recorded in Acts are not normal Christian experiences. Luke is not telling us this is the way everyone relates to the Holy Spirit. First you become a Christian and then later perhaps you might be baptized in the Spirit. He is showing us how the gospel advanced just as Jesus said it would from Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now there's no doubt that the Spirit can and does come in power on Christians at different times. And some of these experiences are inexplicable, and we don't know exactly how to categorize them, but it is true. The Spirit comes and He gives specific power for specific opportunities and purposes at different times. But when He does so, it's always with a view of making the gospel of Jesus known in power. We see this again in the book of Acts, as in Acts chapter 4, verse 8, when we read, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, and because he was filled with the Holy Spirit, was able to preach to the Jewish leaders opposing him with power. We see it later in that chapter, in verse 31, after the apostles and disciples got together in prayer, and the face of persecution coming against them, they asked the Lord to intervene. And during that prayer meeting, Acts 4.31 says the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. But this is a different experience than being indwelt by the Spirit. To be indwelt by the Spirit is something that every Christian knows, every Christian experiences, and they experience it at the point of conversion. This is what Paul means in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, when he says, for in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and are, were all made to drink of one spirit. This happens to everyone who becomes a Christian. When you trust Christ, it's because the spirit is working in you and the spirit who works in you, granting you repentance and faith to turn from sin and trust Jesus, takes up residence within you. In that sense, he baptizes you 
in himself. You're baptized into one body, the body of Christ. So every Christian has been baptized in the Spirit. This happens only once. It happens at the point of conversion. But as Christians, we can repeatedly go on being filled with the Spirit, indeed as we are admonished to in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. God does come to us and empower us for making Christ known. To be in the Spirit is to have the Spirit in you. That's why Paul goes on in the latter part of verse 9 and says, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. To be a Christian is to have the Spirit, to be in the Spirit. If you do not have the Spirit, you do not belong to Christ. You're not a Christian. So it's a very serious error to suggest that you can be just a Christian and not be a Spirit-baptized Christian or not have the Spirit dwell within you. I want to point out the way the Holy Spirit's described in this passage. Look at verse 9. He's called the Spirit of God. The latter part of that verse, he's the Spirit of Christ. So the proper designation that we have in the Scripture throughout the New Testament is the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit. And then the Spirit of Christ, which is a clear reference to the Spirit in relationship to the Son of God. And then look at verse 11. The Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead. Well, that's a more direct reference to God the Father. And then look again at verse 9 and verse 10. Note the switch from the Spirit in you, in verse 9, do you see in verse 10? To Christ in you. Isn't that interesting to see the way the Apostle Paul uses these different designations to talk about this saving work that's happened to believers? These references do not mean that the Father, the Son, the Spirit are identical or interchangeable. Rather, it does show us just how inseparable the work of the Spirit, the Father, and the Son are in salvation. We see the same Trinitarian emphasis about God's work in salvation in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14 where Paul puts it almost like a hymn of praise in those verses, a doxology with three different stanzas, one for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Spirit. In verse 4, he says in Ephesians 1, that He, God the Father, chose us in Christ to the praise of His glory. Verse 7, he says that the Son of God, who gave us redemption by His blood to the praise of of his glory. And then in verses 13 and 14, he talks about the Spirit who enables us to believe and who seals us to the praise of the glory of his grace. Our triune God provides for us a Trinitarian salvation that involves the saving activity of the Father, the saving activity of the Son, and the saving activity of the Spirit. And when God saves a person, he takes up residence in that person. He indwells those whom he saves, and he does it through the ministry of his Spirit. So to be in the Spirit is to have God himself dwell within you. In these verses, Paul goes on to teach us also that to be in the Spirit is to have assurance of eternal life. Look at verse 10. He speaks of this eternal life that we possess right now. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin... The spirit is life because of righteousness. The body is dead because of sin. He's talking about now our physical bodies. He's not talking about the flesh, the way that he's used flesh up until this point. But he is talking about the physical realities that we experience as um, incarnate creatures, as those who are flesh and blood. Sin is what causes the body to experience death. It's the consequences of sin that brings physical death. The reason we have funerals is because of sin. God created mankind upright. Adam and Eve without sin were created to live forever. When sin came, it brought death, including physical death. But he says the spirit is life. Here he's referring again to the Holy Spirit. Some take this particular reference to be the human spirit. And they say Paul's contrasting the physical body from the spiritual life 
of a person, his inner life versus his outer life. Well, I'm convinced that's not correct. I think our English Standard Version is accurate in in capitalizing spirit here. The same word is used for human spirit and Holy Spirit. It's just the same word. But when our English translators interpret it as the Holy Spirit, it's always capitalized. And so it's rightly capitalized here, I believe, when we consider how Paul's been speaking of the Spirit in the eight previous times in verses 1 through 9 where he uses the word Spirit, it's always in reference to the third person of the Trinity. In verse 11, which immediately follows this passage we're looking at, the Spirit's described as the life-giving Spirit. Look at verse 11. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit. He's the life-giving Spirit. That corresponds exactly to what Paul says in verse 10 as the Spirit of life. But what does he mean by saying He is the Spirit of life because of righteousness? Well, he's saying He's the source of our spiritual life. The Spirit is And he is this because of righteousness. This is a reference to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The righteousness that Christ earned that is given to all who trust in him. That righteousness that causes our record in heaven to be wiped clean because God overlays what Jesus did on our lives record and he sees us now in the light of Christ because we are in Christ, we're trusting Christ And his righteousness is what justifies us. And so the spirit of life is able to do what he does because of the righteousness of the son through his life, death, and resurrection. The life that Christians have in the power of God's spirit is the life that has been, uh, is being accomplished in them through what Jesus has once and for all time done. It is the work of Jesus that the work of the Spirit rests upon in order to make us spiritually alive. We read in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. Sin brings spiritual death. It separates us from God. It, It brings physical death. It causes the very seeds of death to live in our bodies and It will bring eternal death when physical death meets spiritual death and you breathe your last outside of Christ. But Paul goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. To be a Christian is to have the Spirit of God live within you and grant you right now eternal life. Your body will still die. It's deteriorating because of the consequences of sin. But your soul is made alive to God when you first come to trust Christ because the Spirit gives you life. And at that moment, you are as alive to God as you will ever be. A Christian is someone who's been born again. It's being made new. So I want to ask you, it, it, does this describe you? I mean, can you honestly say, yes, I, I know this. I know that God has done something in me. You may not be able to know the moment, the day, or even the the ways that he has worked, but you're sitting here this morning, you say, yes, I know. I know that I'm the way that I am. I think the way that I do. I love the things I do because of the Spirit of God in me. If you know that, praise God. Brother, sister, he's made you a Christian. But if you can't say that, don't settle for being religious. Don't think that you've gone far enough because you have paid some attention to the things that some of the things the Bible says. But look at what this passage says and ask the Lord to work in you and do for you what you cannot do for yourself so that you might come truly to know him, to be reconciled to him. God gives his spirit. His spirit owns his word. And through the ministry of the word and spirit, Our eyes are open to see Christ and we see our sin and we turn from our sin and we trust Jesus. And if you've never trusted the Lord Jesus before, trust him now. Believe him now. Take God at his word now because he will receive you. The eternal life we have in the spirit is eternal life now. But in verse 11, Paul projects it out further. 
It is eternal life forever. He says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus, Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Christians are indwelt by the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead. This is a mind boggling truth to just stop and meditate on. The same spirit whereby God raised Jesus, a dead man from the dead, never to die again, dwells in every Christian. If you're a Christian, you're indwelt by supernatural power in the person of God's spirit. Some of you are old enough to remember when Yugos roamed the roads of the United States. Yugos were a communist-made car. They were sold in the United States from 1986 to 1992, and then they went bankrupt, and you couldn't get parts, and you finally couldn't get the cars. And uh, The man who brought Yugos to the United States thought he would make a bundle in doing so, but the car was rated the worst car in history by Car and Driver magazine. You wonder why. Well, it had a 68 cubic inch engine, 55 horsepower. It could go from zero to 60 in 14 seconds. And to top it all off, Yugo's performed terribly in crash tests. Now imagine if you learned to drive in a Yugo. And then for the next 10 years, that's all you ever drove was a Yugo. You put your foot down on the gas pedal, and 14 seconds later, you're up to 60 miles an hour, maybe. And then after 10 years, somebody comes to you and says, hey, man, I'm going to give you this brand new Ford F-150 eight-cylinder engine. And you get behind it, and you grab the steering wheel, and you, you think, you know, I'm still in a Yugo, and I'm not sure what this will do. And somebody says, hey, let's take a road trip to New York City. Let's pull this trailer. And you think, I can't do that. Are you kidding me? Ten years, I can barely get the car to move. And, and you forget that you're sitting in an F-150. But if you remember you're sitting in an F-150 and you realize, well, wait a minute, this really is roadworthy. This really does have the power. I really can make this trip. Then you will venture out and do what you're called to do. Brothers and sisters, in a very similar way, we need to remember we're not what we used to be outside of Christ. We used to be slaves to sin. We used to be in the flesh. But now we're in the Spirit. And the Spirit of the very God who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us. So as we look at what the Bible says, and what the Bible calls us to be, what it calls us to do, and the temptation because of the sin that remains in you, because of habits you developed over a lifetime of unbelief, began to convince you, no, it's not for you. You can't do that. Be realistic. You need to come back to the truth that God says about you. No. You're inhabited by the Spirit. You are inhabited by the one who has supernatural power. You're inhabited by the one who hovered over the waters at creation's birth. The one who raised a dead man from the grave, never to die again. So the challenges, the opportunities that come our way, and the word of God says, be this, do this, resist this, stop that. When you think, ah, I've been living like this so long, you know, I, I can't. I'm just going to try to get by the best I can. No. No. Take God at His word. And cry out to God, God, you say that your spirit lives within me and you're calling me to do this and this feels like death to me. I don't see any way in the world I can do this. Go ahead and admit, okay, I can't do it. But your spirit lives in me. I'm not on my own. Husbands, you're tempted to give up and Loving your wife as Christ loves the church. I mean, who can do that, right? It's an easy cop-out. I'm not Jesus. Well, that's true, you're not. But you're still called to love your wife as Christ loves the church. You say, well, I've tried. Doesn't work. It doesn't matter, brother. 
You have the Spirit of God in you. And by the power of that Spirit, you're to commit yourself to this pathway. And you're not to give up. And when you fail, you confess your failures. You get up and you start over and you do it the rest of your life. Wives, you're called to be submissive and respectful to your husbands. And you say, well, but you don't know my husband. Doesn't matter. If you know Christ, the Spirit of God lives within you. And as you see what the Bible tells you to be and do, and how you are to relate to your husband, then you are to commit yourself to that, trusting the Spirit to empower you to do it. And when you fail... You confess your sin, you get up, you start over. Parents, you ever tempted to just throw in the towel, just kind of hang on until they're 18, right? You know, just get out of the house? No, no. We are called to bring our children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord to train them in the ways of Christ. You say, but my kids don't listen to me. They don't respect me. I've had so many bad years of bad patterns established that, you know, it's just, it's, it's hopeless. Well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're going to take God at his word or you're not. And his word says that the spirit of God lives in you. So when you see the word of God telling you to bring your children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, do not exasperate them then by the power of that Spirit, you commit yourself to that path again. And where you fail, you get up and you start over. Single adults, you think, well, you know, pastors hadn't brought me up yet. Well, guess what? <laughs> this has something for you too. It has something for all of us here, right? You think, well, yeah, but I want to be married, and so I'm not married. And so until I get married, I'm going to kind of just coast and, and do this and you know, take life easy. No. Read 1 Corinthians 7 and see what God says to single adults. You're to resist temptation to unholiness that surrounds you. And you're to pursue holiness and you are to exercise the time, the talents, the opportunities, the resources God entrusts in you at this stage of your life to zealously live for Christ, to serve in His kingdom in ways that those who are married maybe can't do. And you say, but... You know, man, that's so disruptive to my schedule. Doesn't matter. You have the Spirit of God. You think, well, I can't do that. You know, I'm going to wait until I'm more so. No, you have the Spirit of God in you. Believe it. And renounce all of this stuff that would tempt you to say, no, I'm just going to keep living the way I've been living. No. I'm just not able to grow. I don't understand the Bible. Well, then you need to get up earlier and read it more. I just, you know, no, you have the Spirit of God. Let's do away with our excuses. And let's look to the Bible and see what the Bible tells us to be, what it calls us to do. Let us look at the opportunities in the light of what the Scripture says is right and good and true. And when we see the opportunities and they look grand, but they seem so much more beyond what we can bring to the table, let us not be inhibited by that because there's more going on in us than what is evident to be put on the table. We have the Spirit of God. Just as God raised Jesus from the dead, so He will raise your mortal body from the dead by His Spirit. This is what Paul says. He will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. He will raise you together with Christ on that day that Jesus Christ returns. Yes, our physical bodies have the seeds of death in them. But physical death is not the end of a Christian. It will be followed by a bodily, eternal resurrection, just as Jesus was raised from the dead with a new body that is fit for all of eternity. So his people who die in him will be raised from the dead with new bodies that will be fit for all of eternity. This is what Paul means in 1 Corinthians 15 when he says that Christ is the first fruits. Of all who will follow after him. He's gone before us. He's the trailblazer. A real man experienced real death. Bodily death. Was raised bodily from the dead. Never to die again. And that is the destiny of everyone who's trusting Jesus Christ. We will be raised by this same spirit. All who are in Christ 
will, after Christ, be raised with Christ. This is the destiny for those who live in the Spirit. So, brothers and sisters, because of the presence of the Holy Spirit of God in your life, remember this, you are not living a merely mortal human existence. You're living life in the Spirit. God Himself indwells you. He has given you supernatural, eternal life. So live intentionally, consciously by the Spirit. Don't settle to go on living at some low level of engagement with God. Take Him at His word. Trust His Spirit. Commit yourself to doing what He commands you, knowing that you're not on your own as you make the attempt. Because God Himself is living in you by His Spirit. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this glorious truth that you've not left us in this world on our own, but you've given us your spirit. And I pray that you would show us how to encourage one another to live in your spirit in such a way that we are dependent upon him. That it'll be evident to all that what is going on in us is not our own strength, our own wisdom, our own power, but it is that supernatural power that is working in your people by your spirit. I pray for those who came today that are outside of Christ. Open their eyes. Spirit of God, you alone can do this. We pray that you would, that you would take your word and cause Jesus to be presented to the minds and hearts of those outside of Christ as a great and glorious Savior. Draw them to Christ today. Grant repentance and faith today. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.